Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> the title of the series is, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Hmm, last days, Hebrews? That sounds like it was about 2,000 years ago. This is lesson number seven in that series for February 12 tw of 2022, entitled, Jesus, the Anchor of the Soul. I think you're going to find it interesting. Let's begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we wish we could see in person Paul as he's struggling with writing this message to some people who were inclined to slip away and, and, and go backwards. Um, imagine how he felt, he, he, he mentions how he felt about those people who were slipping away and he, he, he must have spent hours praying for them in the middle of the night and so forth. We can't see him, but we can read what he, he wrote and, and, and try to fill in the, the ideas in between the lines. Help us now as we study this book together that we may represent you correctly in all that we say and do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in our lesson for this week, Paul had been talking about the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. He had introduced the subject of Melchizedek, but then he took an interlude, and here's our interlude. Hebrews 5, 11 to 6, 3. Jim, can you tell us about that? There is much we have to say about this matter that it is hard to explain to you because you are so slow to understand. There has been enough time for you to be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. Let us go forward then in mature teaching and leave behind us the first lessons of the Christian message. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God of teaching about baptisms and laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Let us go forward. And this is what we will do if God allows American Bible Society 1992 Good News Translation. Okay, as we have discussed, Paul did not give a lot of information about his audience. We had a whole lesson on that earlier in our series. However, he wrote that there was a lot more that he would like to say, but he could not, and why not? Those hearers have become dull of hearing, he says. They should have been bright and sharp and ready to <clears throat> teach others. However, they still needed to go over the simple basic teachings, truths of Christianity. Paul wished they were ready to deal with the high priestly ministry of Christ and the subject of Melchizedek, but apparently they were not. And you can understand why maybe they won't under, weren't able to do that or weren't ready to do that when you, we see all the ins and outs of high priestly ministry coming up. So those points that he talked about in the first part of chapter 6, are those the basics of Christianity? The uselessness of works, believing in God, teaching about baptism, laying on of hands, are, are those the basic teachings that well, he's referring to? The resurrection I, of the dead, eternal judgment? Yeah. I've wondered about that in the past. I suspect that those were issues that might have been, that he knew that they were arguing about. May not have been the basic tenets of the church, but these are ones that they had questions about. That's what I'm suspecting. Because he puts it in the context where he thinks, you should be mature, but instead yeah. we have to go back to... Yeah the milk, and it sounds like this is supposed to be the milk. They are some of the milk, obviously, things. I mean, resurrection of the dead and baptism and so forth. Those sounds like pretty basic things. Well, then Paul picked up an even more difficult problem, and this is probably what we should spend more of his time on. Some of his hearers were apparently actually backsliding and apostatizing from their Christian beliefs. 
There are two key passages that describe that unfortunate situation. Let us read them and later consider them in depth. Carrie? I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For how can those who abandon their faith be brought back to repent again? They were once in God's delight. They tasted heaven's gift and received their share of the Holy Spirit. They knew from experience that God's word is good, and they had felt the powers of the coming age. And then they abandoned their faith. It is impossible to bring them back to repent again because they are again crucifying the Son of God and exposing Him to the public shame. Let me interrupt for a moment. That word impossible sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, continuing, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. For there is no longer any sacrifice that will take away sins if we purposely go on sinning after the truth has been made known to us. Instead, all that is left is to wait in fear for the coming judgment and the fierce fire which will destroy those who oppose God. Anyone who disobeys the law, disobeys, make that too clear, the law of Moses is put to death without any mercy when judged guilty on the evidence of two or more witnesses. What then? of those who despise the Son of God, who treat as a cheap thing the blood of God's covenant which purified them from sin, who insult the Spirit of grace. Just think how much worse is the punishment they will deserve. Again from the Good News Bible. Okay, let me just see if I can spell that out a little bit. They were used to a, a, a situation where they had very simple courts that didn't, I mean, nothing like what we have in all our big business we go on, to, go on about today. There would be a judge, probably a priest, something like that, and if two people came and said that someone had committed a serious crime, they were put to death, bang like that, on the, on the word of two witnesses. And now he's saying, okay, now we have God himself witnessing and, and, and telling us the truth. And if we ignore that information, if we pretend like that doesn't matter, we go the other way when God himself is speaking. I mean, Moses versus God, you know. <laughs> Read superficially in an older English version, these passages, and I should have quoted the King James here, these passages could be very troubling. Is it really true that if one accepts Christianity and then falls away, that there is no possibility? Remember, we, we looked at the word impossible. No possibility for him or her to come back? Is his or her fate sealed? Is she or he certain to perish in the final fires of the third coming? Well, I'm happy to tell you that I had the privilege of studying Koine Greek for six years. So in, if we all understood Koine Greek and the careful wording Paul uh, that Paul used, we would ha not have this problem. Again, notice the description of these people. What's, what stands out in the description of these people? They were once in God's light. In other words, they had received the message. They tasted heaven's gift. They had the promise of redemption, received their share of the Holy Spirit. They, you know, I don't know how much that includes. I mean, in some cases, those who received the Holy Spirit could speak in multiple languages to anyone they came, came upon. I don't know how this includes that much or not. They knew from experience that God's word is good and they had felt the powers of the coming age. So these people, I mean, these would be considered saints, I would think. Then going to Hebrews 10, 29, Paul described these people in other terms as those who despise the Son of God and those who treat it as a cheap thing, the blood of God's covenant, which purified from sin. And Paul said they insulted the spirit of grace. Well, now, could this be a danger for Christians, even Seventh-day Adventists in the 21st century? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it easy for us to become discouraged, perhaps uh, because of trials and temptations or just the day-to-day challenges of living a life in the 21st century? What do we know about those people and the exp expressions which Paul used to describe them? No, from Gordon? the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, February 6. To have enlightened means to have experienced conversion, Hebrews 10.32. 
it refers to those who have turned from the darkness of the power of Satan to the light of God, Acts 26, 17 and 18. It implies deliverance from sin, Ephesians 5, 11, and ignorance, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. The verbal form here suggests that this enlightening is an act of God achieved through Jesus, quote, the brightness of his glory, end quote, Hebrews 1, 3. So this would suggest that these people had become, I mean, these weren't just people who walked in one day and walked out. They had, had been... They'd experienced. Yeah. Had experience. Continuing from the Bible study guide, to, to, quote, have tasted the heavenly gift, end quote, and, quote, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, end quote, are synonymous expressions. The gift of God may refer to his grace, Romans 5.15, or to the Holy Spirit, through whom God imparts that grace, Acts 2.38. Those who have tasted the Holy Spirit, John 7, 37 to 39, and 1 Corinthians 12, 13, have experienced the grace of God, which includes the power to fulfill his will, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I think those are the verses about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, right? Yeah, exactly. Continuing from the Bible study guide, to taste, quote, the goodness of the word of God, end quote, Hebrews 6, 5, is to experience personally the truth of the gospel, 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. Quote, the powers of the age to come, end quote, refers to the, miracul to the miracles God will perform for believers in the future. Resurrection, John 5, 28 and 29. Transformation of our bodies and eternal life. Believers, however, are beginning to taste them in the present. They have experienced a spiritual resurrection, Colossians 2, 12 and 13, a renewed mind, Romans 12, 2, and eternal life in Christ, John 5, 23. Now, I don't know how you have enjoyed listening to those passages. I can tell you that our writer for this quarter is deep into religious studies and I mean it's like he's writing a, a thesis or, I mean a doctoral dissertation here everything has to be documented I mean there there are some of these lessons that I swear have a hundred biblical references in them and I try to look them all up to see, make sure I don't miss something that's important and it's a it's a chore anyway Paul was probably thinking about the Israelites coming out of Egypt and so we, we're going to see this in a number of places. We already have seen some about this. He calls them the wilderness generation. He's, he's comparing those people who had seen those incredible miracles. They had seen the plagues of Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. Remember that miracle? And they had seen Mount Sinai. They had seen God come down on the mountain. They had seen the cloud that hung over the tabernacle. They had seen, they had put taken of the, the water that came out of the rock. They had eaten the manna every day. I mean, how much more evidence could you possibly have for God's presence and his care for you, and yet they rebelled against him? So he's now comparing that generation with the people in Paul's day. They had experienced many things from God's hand, it for light by night and so forth, we've already mentioned, they've been guided by God himself and with the help of the Holy Spirit. They had tasted the good word of God. Think of all the miracles from God they had witnessed in Egypt when they were delivered from Egyptian slavery. However, despite all that, as we know, that older generation, everybody over 20 years of age, repeatedly, repeatedly rebelled against God in the wilderness and ended up dying there. Paul was certainly hoping that something similar would not be the experience of the friends to whom he was writing. In Romans 6, verse 6, Paul suggested, Myra? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And we know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on the cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed so that we may no longer be the slaves of sin. Good News Bible. Okay, and do we all understand, and you out there, do you clearly understand what it means to put to death, to be put to death with Christ on his cross? That's one of the challenges we're going to struggle with. How does that actually happen? We weren't there 2,000 years ago. None of us have experienced actual crucifixion unless 
some of you people have some experiences that I don't know anything about. Paul expressed a similar idea in Galatians 5, 24, and I quote, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have put to death their human nature with all its passions and desires. Well, here's a bit of an explanation. The original text in Greek emphasizes the word impossible, and we, we talked about that a little above there a moment. It is impossible for God to restore those who have fallen away because they are crucifying once again the Son of God, Hebrews 6.6. 6. Paul wants to stress that there is no other way of salvation except through Christ, which we understand and accept from Acts 4, verse 12. Salva salvation by any other means is, um, is as impossible as it is for God to lie, Hebrews 6, 18, or to please God without faith, Hebrews 11, 6. That's from our Bible study guide from Monday, February 7. What do these images bring up in your mind? What does it mean to crucify again the Son of God? Think of what the religious leaders did to Jesus. He posed a threat to their supremacy and their authority. By getting him condemned and crucifying him, they believed they would get him out of the way. He was regarded as a powerful and dangerous enemy. And what about us? Does the gospel challenge our sovereignty and self-determination? What did Jesus mean when he said that we should take up the cross? And what about denying ourselves? Any of you uh, been carrying a cross around recently? No. no? Certainly not literally. Not literally, okay. If we have been following the Christian way for some time, how can we be sure that we have experienced this death to self? Do you feel dead? What would that mean? Well, in Romans 6, 1 through 11, Paul attempted to describe that experience in some detail. He starts out by talking about uh, what happens in baptism and so forth, or at least what's supposed to happen. And in Romans 6, verse 4, we have some comments on that. Jim? By our baptism, then, we, are, we were buried with him and shared his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might see, excuse me, we might live a new life. Good news Bible. <clears throat> Reading again Romans 6, 6, we know that our old being was put to death with Christ on his cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed so that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. That's another version of that story, I mean, 6, 6. So what kind of change did you experience when you were baptized? Do you remember that in any detail? That was a long time ago for me. It was a long time ago for me too, but I do remember at the moment when I went under the water, I thought, I'm going to come up feeling different. Mm -hmm. Being different. <laughs> I thought I would feel different. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel a whole lot different, and I was, I was waiting for that Unfortunately, I was, um, I took that, that experience quite seriously. Um, I ended up being baptized with a couple of my closest friends in those days who ended up being bank robbers. <laughs> so, uh, they, were, they were into all kinds of mischief even back in those days. So were so, you a bank robber too? I was not a bank robber. Um, they were so good actually at that bank robbing business, they finally got caught, but it w they were so good that they were written up in a crime magazine. <laughs> they were good. Amazing. Well, something may have happened many years ago, but however, what is happening in your life as a Christian today? Do we honestly recognize that following Christ is a hand-to-hand -hand struggle to the death? That's what it says in Romans 8 and Galatians 5. Well, Matthew 16, 24. Gary, I think that's yours. Yes. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anybody, anyone rather, wants to come with me, he must forget self, carry his cross, and follow me. That's from the Good News Bible. When we get to see this stuff in the panorama, we'll try to, I, I hope we'll get to see the details of Christ's life you know, moment by moment, so forth. I'm going to look and see. I want to know, when Jesus said, carry your cross, 
what, were, what did the disciples say? To, what? What's he talking about? Yeah. Carry the cross? I mean, they had signed up to be members of the first cabinet, right, of the new nation. Carry his cross? Yeah. I'm sure they had not a clue. Yeah. There's some people who literally do that, yeah. trying to gain favor with God. Yeah. They're, they do this every year. Probably multiple groups do it, carrying the cross up the uh, Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem from the place where he was condemned up to the place where they believe he was, you know, crucified. Um, it's what a, do you think they're trying to do by that? Oh, they're Again, trying to make probably, it... Probably get some offerings, get some people to pay well, up. Is it to gain favor with God, or is it to show off, or...? Uh, I think probably for many of them it's to gain favor with God. Um, I hope for some it's an attempt to try to really get a feel for the experience. Yeah. Maybe that's about as good as you could get. What did the words carry his cross or take up the cross mean to the disciples when Jesus first spoke them? Yeah. They certainly had no idea what was coming. Remember that even during the Last Supper they were arguing amongst themselves about who would be in the highest position in the new kingdom they believed Jesus was going to set up. Man, I just, that just... You could sense it there, can't you? It's just... In order to emphasize his absolute conviction that the salvation comes only through Jesus Christ, and we hopefully we all believe that, Paul contrasted that salvation with the offering of sacrifices in the Old Testament. And so now we're going to jump over to Hebrews chapter 10, 1 to 4, and we're going to see some very interesting verses that we are going to study in quite a bit of detail in the next several lessons. Gordon? Actually, Hebrews 10, 1 through 14, not yeah. just 4. I'm sorry, 1 to 14. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who come to God? If the people worshiping God had really been purified from their sins, they would not feel guilty of sin anymore, and all sacrifices would stop. Now let's stop there for just a second. Think about the implications of that. If that process in the Old Testament had successfully purified people so that they didn't they stopped sinning completely, which would be the ultimate goal, wouldn't it be the ideal that would be the ideal. You know, you come and you offer your sacrifice, you get your sins taken care of, and you stop sinning. Obviously that would be miraculous, that would be wonderful, but of course it didn't happen. Continuing, verse 3, As it is, however, the sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins, for the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Okay, that's going to be very interesting because in Hebrews 9.22 it says, remember, backing up a couple of verses, Without the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's King James. Yeah. Many of the other translations now say forgiveness. Yeah. Is, uh, remission is correct because mm -hmm. if sin is a disease, what do you need? Forgiveness? No, you need healing. You yeah. need remission of your sin. And uh, as it turns out that he's going to emphasize our, our person here that's writing the lessons is going to take us back to Leviticus 17.11 where it says sins do take away. I mean, blood does take away sin. And here are these verses, here in verse 4 and verse 11, it says it does not. Hebrews 9.22 from the Good News says, Indeed, according to the law, almost everything is purified by blood, and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. Yep. So a slightly different uh, version yeah. of that from the King James. Well, those who want to take a more forensic version, view of things say, well, they know about what these verses say, and so they go back to that verse and they say, well, Obviously, that can't be talking about the Old Testament, even though it's in the section that's talking about the Old Testament. This has to be talking about Jesus. We'll get to that more in more detail later. 
It all depends upon your paradigm, your yes. your preconceived idea of what what's going on. Yeah. Verse 5, for this reason, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God, quote, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you have prepared a body for me. You are not pleased with animals burnt whole on the altar or with sacrifices to take away sins. I can tell you that we have a future lesson that's all about whole burnt offerings and so forth. So go ahead. But Jesus said to God, you are not pleased with those offerings. Yeah. yeah. Verse 7, then I said, here I am to do your will, O God, just as it is, just as it is written of me in the book of the law. And he repeats. First he said, you neither want nor are pleased with sacrifices and offerings, or with animals burnt on the altar and the sacrifices to take away sins. He said this, even though all these sacrifices are offered according to the law, so, yeah. the law that God had given. Yeah, the law that God had given, and they followed it exactly, very carefully, but it didn't work, okay? Then he said, here I am, O God, to do your will. So God does away with all the old sacrifices and put the sac puts the sacrifice of Christ in their place. Because Christ Jesus did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified from sin by the offering that he made of his own body since, uh, own body once and for all. So the blood of bulls and goats doesn't purify us from sin, but the blood of Jesus does. That would be the, what some would, people would want us to say. Well, you got Romans, remember Romans 5.10, he says we are, Reconciled, I think, not, not necessarily the best word there, but, but by his death, but we are healed, saved by his life. Mm. And his blood is symbolic of life. He came to, to as a teacher, mm -hmm. not as a penalty payer. That's, that's a lot of that stuff is pagan talk. <clears throat> well, go ahead. Verse 11. Every Jewish priest performs the services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times but these sacrifices can never take away sins. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sin, an offering that is effective forever. And then he sat down at the right-hand side of God. There he now waits until God puts his enemies as a footstool under his feet. With one sacrifice, then, he has made perfect forever those who are purified from sin. Good News Bible. Okay, who gets purified? I mean, I'm sorry. He, who is made perfect? Those who are purified from sin, right? Then he followed that passage with the words recorded in Hebrews 10, 29, and, I'm sorry, 26 to 20, and that we read earlier. And there it is again. Myra? Okay. For there is no longer any sacrifice that will take away sins if we purposely go on sinning after truth has been made known to us. Instead, all of us are left to wait in fear for the coming judgment and the fierce fire that will destroy it, those who oppose God. Anyone who did So some people had the same view of yeah. God back then. Mm -hmm. Fire is going to come if you yep. if you don't obey. That's not something new. No, not new at all. Anyone who disobeys the law of Moses is put to death without any mercy when judged guilty on the evidence of two or more witnesses. Okay, that's what we mentioned earlier. You have two people witness against you that you've done something seriously wrong, you're dead. I mean, and now, in light of that, that was based on the law that Moses gave. Now, if you look at Christ's evidence and, and a law that's given by God himself. Yeah. What then of those who despise the Son of God? Who treat who treat as cheap, a cheap thing, the blood of God's covenant, which purified them from sin, who insult the spirit of grace. Just think how much worse the punishment they will deserve. Okay, is he trying to scare them? It, it sounds that way. Notice it does not say that there is no way for sin to be forgiven. It says that those who are described as trampling underfoot the Son of God, profaning the blood of the covenant, outraging the Holy Spirit, Hebrews 10, 29, cannot expect to be accepted by God into heaven. 
I mean, what would happen if you took some of those people to heaven? Start the great controversy all over again. Once again, let us notice these expressions. And I quote the expression, this is from our Bible study guide, the expression trampled the Son of God underfoot, Hebrews 10, 29, describes the rejection of Jesus' rule. The title Son of God, which means a divine being, reminded the audience that God has installed Jesus at his right hand and promised to make his enemies a footstool for his feet. And there's all the references. The trampling of Jesus underfoot implies that the apostate has treated Jesus as an enemy. In the context of the argument of the epistle from Hebrews 1.13, it could be implied that as far as the life of the apostate is concerned, Jesus has been taken off the throne, which is occupied now by the apostate himself, and set as the footstool instead. This is what Lucifer wanted to do in heaven, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, and what the lawless one would attempt to do in the future. The expression is profaned the blood of the profaned the blood of the covenant refers to the rejection of Jesus' sacrifice. It implies that the blood of Jesus is devoid of cleansing power. So, I mean, basically, if you're, the, how does Jesus' blood cleanse? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's very forensic language. Yes, I'm going to put Philippians two five in there. Yeah, you know that it, it would. If you don't, what you need is the way you, uh, healing is the way you think. Mm -hmm. Let this mind be in you as is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Now, learn to, whatever he taught, incorporate that. And then that could, would be eternal life for you, John 17, 3 and 4. So is this the people that are still drinking the milk? Well, these are people who are probably drinking the milk maybe in church, but the rest of the time they're living lives that are completely out of line with what they're professing. That seems to be what he's saying. These are the ones that are walking away from the church? Mm -hmm. Yes. The Greek term anubrisis, insult or outrage, involves the manifestation of hubris, which refers to insolence or arrogance. This term stands in stark contrast to the description of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Grace. It implies that the apostate has responded to God's offer of grace with an insult. I mean, imagine God offers you eternal life, etc., and in, in response you insult him. The apostate is, an, is in an in, untenable position. He rejects Jesus, his sacrifice, and Jesus, his sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit from our Bible study guide for February, for two, February 8th. But after all those stern words, Paul talked about better things. He used the illustration of barren land that receives rain and sunshine and then bears good fruit. That's what it's supposed to do, right? Just like a person who receives all these blessings from God is supposed to bear good fruit, supposed to, you know, join the... Well, Hebrews 6, 9 to 12 describes what Paul meant. And I read... But even if we speak like this, dear friends, we feel sure about you. So he says, I've told you that it's pretty serious if you wander away, but I, I don't think that's talking about you. It's not really you that I'm talking about. We know that you have the better blessings that belong to your salvation. God is not unfair. He will not forget the work you did or the love you showed for him and the help you gave and are still giving to your fellow Christians. Our great desire is that each of you keep up your eagerness to the end so that the things you hope for will come true. We do not want you to become lazy, but to be like those who believe and are patient and so receive what God has promised. From the Good News Bible. Paul was not t talking about one-time one events in someone's life. Jim? Believers show their love toward God's name that is, toward God himself, by the service of the, excuse me, by their servants, first, excuse me, service to the saints. These were not isolated actions in the past, but sustained action, actions that have extended to, into the present. Exceptional, exceptional acts do not reveal the true character of a person. The weightiest evidence of love toward God is not religious acts per se but acts of love toward fellow human beings, especially those who are disadvantaged, Matthew 10, 42, and Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Thus Paul exhorted believers not to forget to do 
good. Hebrews 13, 2 and 16. Okay, that's from Wednesday, February 9. Faith, as James and Paul said, is alive and active when it is exercised toward others. Faith in God will be expressed by love toward our fellow human beings. Paul had already described what he believed was a lack of faith by the people traveling in the wilderness as recorded in the book of Numbers. And we know those stories, and I hope you do out there as well. The whole book of Numbers is full of all the, it's the book of rebellions, really. By contrast, he turned to talk about Abraham, Hebrews 6, 13 to 15, as the great example of faith in the Old Testament. And, you know, Abraham is called the friend of God, he's called the, the father of the faithful, and so forth. Um, he went on to describe Hebrews 11. You remember in Hebrews 11, there's that whole list of saints down to, and you start off with people like Abel and, and, and Abraham and Noah and those kind of people. You think, okay, this is good. And then you get down to Rab Rahab and Gideon and Samson. You, oh, wow. And all the children of Israel. And all the children of Israel. Mm. Then he goes on to the highest example of all, climaxing in Hebrews 12, 1 through 4, with the example of Jesus Christ. That's yours? My turn, I think. Yeah. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses round us. He's talking about what we just read in Hebrews 11, or what they, should, they had just heard in Hebrews 11. So then let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds onto us so tightly. And let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross, on the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him. He thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God's throne. You know, I, I, I don't know if we will get to have the privilege when we see the panorama of seeing what was going through Christ's mind as he's dying on the cross. It must have been an incredible battle. I mean, he was, Satan was doing, I mean, Satan knew. This was, the, this is curtains for him. If he doesn't get Christ at, at this point in time, if Christ dies successfully, and then of course, rises to life back again after being in the grave, it's all over for Satan. There may be a lot of delay, 2,000 years now, but it's, the ultimate fate is, is, is sealed. So Satan must have been just doing everything he possibly could to, to harass Christ, and yet Christ knew of the promises that he had already received from his Father. Wow, what was going on in his brain must have been just yeah. screaming. Okay. Think of what he went through, how he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. For in your struggle against sin, you have not yet had to resist resists rather to the point of being killed. That's in wow. his Bible. It's putting so, it bluntly. Does that mean that um, someday we will be have to resist to the point of death? Possible. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. The Apostle John reminded us in Revelation 14, verse 12, that this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Are there times when it is necessary for us to speak out against our fellow believers when they, ha they are having a lack of faith or misrepresenting God? Ooh. Is it all right to criticize fellow believers? Well, criticize, hopefully. Is it, is it okay to stay silent when someone criticizes? Yeah, what about that? Well, in Hebrews 6, 17 through 20, Paul talked about how God makes sure that we accept his offers. From the Good News Bible, Hebrews 6, 17 to 20. To those who were to receive what he promised, God wanted to make it very clear that he would never change his purpose. So he added his vow to the promise. There are these two things then that cannot change and about which God cannot lie. 
So we who have found safety with him are greatly encouraged to hold firmly to the hope placed before us. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives. It is safe and sure and goes through the curtain of the heavenly temple into the inner sanctuary. On our behalf, Jesus has gone in there before us and has become a high priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Now we're going to talk about this quite a bit more uh, in future lessons, but let me just review a couple of things. If you remember in Genesis, um, I can't remember exactly what chapter it is, but that that deal where where God said, "Let me make a contract with you, Abraham," and He cut those animals in half and all that kind of stuff. That was recognized as a standard way to make uh, a contract in in the territory that the area where Abraham came from. So that God was reaching down, following the example that Abraham was familiar with, and those contracts. The idea was when you pass through between those animals and you signed the deal at the other end, if you broke down, you, you, if you failed to up, uphold your end of the contract, it was expected that you would cut, be cut in pieces just like those animals. That was what was believed, what was ex to happen, supposed to happen. If you vowed, if you took that vow and signed that oath. So here's God making an oath, make, taking a vow, Wow. Notice especially that the final passage says Jesus has gone in there before us, implying that we are to follow. That is what we learned from John 16, 25 through 27. Jesus Ira? said, I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time has come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, and it was then, you will, not ask, you will ask him in my name. I do, I do not say, notice the word not, which many leave out as they read this passage, since the word not does not match their paradigm. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, he loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Okay, does that nullify all the work of priests in the Old Testament? And what about priests today? Jesus here is just on the night before he was crucified, said to his disciples, I will not pray the Father for you. I will not represent, well, I shouldn't say will not represent you, but it's not for him to speak to the, to the Father. In fact, we're going to go on to see what makes it very clear in the future, Romans 8 especially, in future lessons it's going to say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all pleading for us. Jesus is not pleading with his Father. So and, this verse is basically saying, Jesus is saying, I won't plead with the Father because the Father himself loves you. Right. He doesn't need anyone to plead with him. Do you have any trouble accepting God's guarantee of his promises? Are you inclined to doubt? In Hebrews 6, 17, God guaranteed his promise with an oath. Remember I told you, when you do that, it was expected if you break down on your side of the deal, you, you, you're, you're to die. And he illustrated from experiences in the Old Testament in Exodus 32, 11 through 14, Moses reminded God of the promise he had made to the descendants of Abraham recorded in Genesis 22, and that was the chapter I was talking about. Look at these, this passage, I hope you're familiar with it. Genesis 22, 16 to 18. I make a vow by my own name, the Lord is speaking. Obviously, he couldn't vow on the behalf of someone greater than himself that I will richly bless you. Because you did this and did not keep back your only son from me, I promise that I will give you as many descendants as there are stars in the sky or grains of sand along the seashore. He'd already promised that when they had walked between those two an pieces of animal. Your descendants will conquer their enemies. All the nations will ask me to bless them as I have blessed your descendants, all because you obeyed my command. 
He are, understood. Are yeah. all the nations asking God to bless them? No. That hasn't happened yet. Well, no, it hasn't happened yet. In his discussion, I we don't have time to discuss it, but there's a lot of nations surrounding Israel right now that would do anything possible to get rid of the Israelites. In his discussion of the gospel as addressed to the churches of Galatia, Paul said, Jim, I think that's yours. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. Christ did this in order to, that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, so that through faith we might receive the spirit promised by God. My brothers and sisters, I am going to use an everyday example when two people agree on a matter and sign an agreement, no one can break it or add anything to it. Now, God made his promises to Abraham and his descendants. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but the singular descendant, meaning one person only, namely Christ. Good news Bible. Okay. Paul wanted us to understand very clearly that the gospel is for anyone who has faith not only for Jews or descendants of Abraham, and the famous verse that I like is this one in Galatians 3, 29, 28 and 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Wow. As Paul described, that promise is to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. God has also guaranteed his promises to us by accepting Jesus back into heaven and seating him on the right hand of power. So here's a person who lived on this earth, grew up as a baby and right up through the different stages that we go through as an adult, was crucified, and then returned to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. So what does that guarantee? That guarantees us that Jesus, because he was able to ascend and take that position, God has the ability to take us to heaven and seat us there as well. Jesus accomplished what Satan said was impossible. Furthermore, as we have noted previously, his answers, and, and that of course was he lived a perfect life without sinning. He answered the questions and refuted the accusations Satan has made against God from the very beginning. God's honor has been called into question, but God's reputation has been upheld by the resurrection of Christ and his seating at the right hand of the Father. Do those promises, these promises with oaths encourage you? What do you think of God swearing? Hmm. How do you feel about, not using bad language, I'm talking about taking an oath. How do you feel about the fact that God has made a promise to you and to me? We should never underestimate the issues and challenges in the great controversy. Even on a personal level, sacrificing self, taking up the cross, and following Jesus Christ is never going to be easy. Satan will do everything he possibly can to defeat anyone who tries to do that. Carrie? The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. That's from Ellen G. White, Steps to Christ 43.3. You want to go ahead? Yeah. John desired to become like Jesus, and under the transforming influence of the love of Christ, he did become meek and lowly. Self was hid in Jesus. Above all his companions, John yielded himself to the power of that wondrous life. It was John's deep love for Christ which led him always to desire to be close by his side. The Savior loved all the twelve, but John's was the most respect receptive spirit. 
He was younger than the others and with more of the child's confiding trust, he opened his heart to Jesus. Thus he came more into sympathy with Christ and through him the Savior's deepest spiritual teaching was communicated to the people. The beauty of holiness which had transformed him, that's John, shone with the Christ-like radiance from his countenance. In adoration and love he beheld the Savior until likeness to Christ and fellowship with him became his one desire and in his character was reflected the character of his master. Again, from Ellen White, The Acts of the Apostles, 544.2 through 545.2. Wow, imagine that kind of experience. Hmm. For a challenging comparison of the experience of John the Beloved with the experience of Judas the traitor, read Acts of the Apostles, 539 to 545, and Desire of Ages, 716 to 722 it will just blow you away. John was not always a faithful, obedient, humble follower of Jesus. Remember that he was one of the sons of thunder. Judas had some important traits that could have been helpful to the cause of God. However, he allowed his greed and his envy of Jesus to overwhelm all his good intentions. Why do you think it is necessary for such a total surrender in order to serve God? From our study this week, we can conclude that at one time, the members of this group that Paul was addressing had a good experience with God. It seems pretty clear that at least, God, at least Paul thought so. They had apparently been enlightened. They had tasted the heavenly gift. They had shared in the Holy Spirit. They had tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. That's from the NRSV translation. But then the reaction set in. Some of them were apostatizing. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, and 10, 26 to 29, that we have looked at in considerable detail in this lesson, have been misunderstood for centuries. Many people have thought that once one turns away from being a Christian, she or he can never go back. Interestingly enough, as a result of that idea, some people have delayed their baptism until just before they think they will die, so there's not the possibility of apostasy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's, that's too bad. The experience of Peter in the upper room and at the tile of Jesus give us a good example of how God chooses to work with his faithful children. Matthew 26, 69 to 75. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard when one of the high priest's servant women came to him and said, you too were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it in front of them all. I don't know what you are talking about, he said, and went on out to the entrance of the courtyard. Another servant woman saw him and said to the men there, he was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it and answered, I swear that I don't know what, I don't know that man. After a little while, the men standing there came to uh, Peter. Of course you are one of them, they said. After all, the way you speak gives you away. Then Peter said, I swear that I am telling the truth. May God punish me if mm. I am not. I do not know that man. Wow. Just then the cock crowed and Peter remembered what Jesus had told him. Before the cock crows, you will say three times that you do not know me. He, that is Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Hmm. Good news Bible. After Paul described in Hebrews the initial Christian experience of those at Dressies, some of them had fallen away. What does fallen away mean? Do you know of anyone who has fallen away? How can we avoid that from happening to us? Let us take a moment to try to describe some details in Greek that can help us to better understand these passages in these two chapters in Hebrews. Myra? Now that we understand what the audience of Hebrews experienced, let us now turn to examining the notion of the impossibility of repentance in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. We need to be somewhat critical Technic or technical in our approach. All five metaphors mentioned above, mentioned above are verbal objectives, Adjective. adjectives, principles. Participles. Participles. We're really into the English stuff yeah. here. Yeah, in Greek. 
they are all in the past tense. So that, what that means, it says, these things that people did in the past, the good, all the good things that he's mentioned, they were things that happened in the past in a particular time. Okay, so what happens then? The tense describing the action is an action in the past. The actions are intrinsically terminal. The chain of par participles des <laughs> describes one and the same group and the same group of people. Thus, this part of the audience has gone from being enlightened to apostatizing, therefore, thereby encountering the whole range of religious experiences some time ago. The past, the last part of Hebrews 6.6 6 employs a second blo block of participles. Again, crucify and put him to open shame in Hebrews 6.6. 6. This time, Paul uses the present tense participles. He suddenly switches from the past tense to the present tense, which expresses action in being in action as being in process. Something that's going on right now. Yeah, what does that denote? The present tense represents action as it develops. What is happening at the time of the speaking? Both of these participles describe apostasy in the present tense. Thus, the action is seen as a crime that pre prevents the renewal uh, unto repentance because it makes the apostate the enemy of Christ. He or she crucifies, crucifies the Son of God again and puts him to open shame in, the ongoing ma in an ongoing manner. What does that suggest? To shame Christ is to reenact the crucifi crucifixion. I'm going to interrupt there because we're running out of time. So in summary, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 makes clear that the audience encountered the whole range of religious experiences from conversion to apostasy. What made it impossible for some of them to be renewed to repentance was their attitude of shaming Christ and thus reenacting the crucifixion process. Basically, this attitude, amount, this attitude amounted to declaring Christ as their enemy. However, with an attitude of humble repentance, such as Peter's forgiveness, Peter's forgiveness, forgiveness is always possible. So, we, we can see here clearly that you can do the wrong things, you can continue to do the wrong things, or you can turn back and do what's right. You can repent. Let's pray. Our kind and blessed Father, we thank you. We thank you because of you have accepted your son back to sit beside you on the throne of heaven, even though he has taken on his humanity as, as an inter internal inheritance. We look forward to that fact and, and accept it as a promise that we ourselves, if we're willing to follow your direction, can one day be seated there also around your throne. We thank you for the ways in which you've blessed us through these materials that you've given to us, through your prophets and apostles. May we understand them now better than we have before is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.